We firmly associated the Louis Vuitton brand with the world of luxury. The well-known LV monogram has even turned into a symbol of the whole fashion world. Today, you'll hardly find a company more influential in the fashion realm than the LVMH Group, which owns the most famous fashion houses, jewelry, and cosmetic brands. What's the story behind this brand, though? Let's figure it out. Louis Vuitton, the founder of the company, was born in 1821 in Anchey, a small hamlet in France. His father was a farmer, but Louis himself didn't want to pursue the family business. And that's why, at the age of 13, he went to Paris in search of a better life. It took him two years to reach the city on foot. He mastered joinery and carpentry along the way. He had to make a living, after all. At the time, Paris saw the flourishing of a new empire. Napoleon III was in full power, and it was a time of magnificent dresses and luxurious celebrations. Lou arrived in the city in 1837 at the height of the Industrial Revolution and got a job as an apprentice under Monsieur Marchand, a trunk maker and packer. A quick learner, Louis Vuitton soon became a packer of fashionable outfits for wealthy ladies. In 1854, Vuitton managed to open his own shop, all thanks to the patronage of the stunning Empress Eugenie, Europe's main fashionista. Becoming her personal trunk maker and packer, he made the rich and influential clients, first among the French elite and then from all over Europe. What's more, Empress Eugenie introduced a new type of vacation among the nobility, trips to the sea, and Napoleon built a luxurious palace for his wife in Biritz. When she came there to rest, the trunks made by Lou were perfect to fit all her clothes, and aristocracy and the bourgeoisie poured to the sea after her and resorted to Louis' products too. What was so special about Louis Vuitton that fascinated all the ladies of fashion of that time? The point is, he was not just an excellent trunk maker, but also a revolutionary in matters of transporting luggage. Before him, People transported clothes in chests that were heavy and uncomfortable. They had massive round lids that allowed water to drain off them easily. And the pig skin that covered the chest smelled rather unpleasantly when getting wet. In 1858, Vuitton created his first try-on flat-topped rectangular trunk covered in gray waterproof canvas. You could stack several such trunks one on top of the other for easy transport. Made from poplar wood, they were liked and enjoyed great popularity. In 1859, Vuitton's workshop expanded and moved to Anier. It's still a functioning Vuitton center that carries out individual orders and uses the original technologies of the 19th century. In the Anier's workshop, you can also visit the house and museum of the Vuitton family. Seeing the popularity of the Vuitton goods, other initiative trunk makers started faking his products. Lou tackled this using stripped fabric for his suitcases and guaranteed authenticity of the trunk and distinguished it from the trunks of other makers, highlighting the owner's status. In 1869, after the opening of the Suez Canal, the company acquired a new influential client, Ismail Pasha, the Khedive of Egypt. Lou also created a trunk bed for the legendary explorer Pierre Savonin de Brazza. And this cemented Louis Vuitton's status as the master of trunk making, who can satisfy the needs of his most whimsical customers. In 1975, Louis Vuitton introduced the impressive wardrobe closet, which allowed travelers to keep their clothes safe and convenient anywhere. In 1885, Vuitton's first store opened in London and the company went international. The end of the 19th century was the era of flourishing tourism. Trains and sea travel became more accessible and Vuitton was ready to offer packing for any kind of luggage. To protect his goods from counterfeiting, he put the inscription Louis Vuitton trademark on them. The following year, Lou and his son George introduced a new type of lock for their products. By that time, the Louis Vuitton trunks were already considered a symbol of wealth, and robbers often hunted the owners of his suitcases. So LV came up with a unique spring lock that positively turned a suitcase into a safe. All the Louis Vuitton lock templates were kept securely in Vuitton's workshops. If a client needed another key for their lock, they addressed the workshop directly. 
Once, George even challenged Harry Houdini to free himself from a locked LV suitcase. And the last thing Louis Vuitton did for his company was the famous beige brown jacket Damier pattern designed in 1888. After the death of his father in 1892, George took over the management of the company. His agenda was to fight the increased number of counterfeits. He was the one who invented the familiar monogram that still marks the brand's products, three floral patterns and the initials LV. In 1901, the first iconic LV bag appeared. The steamer went as an addition to a suitcase and was designed to store dirty laundry, but later became universal. Now you can buy the steamer in various colors and shapes, even in the form of a backpack. At the beginning of the 20th century, the number of the company's workers increased, and the brand shifted its focus to drivers. Only the wealthiest people could afford a car back then and were sure to become LV clients. The new type of transport asked for a new type of luggage. So Louis Vuitton created a special bag that could be stored inside the spare wheel and introduced dust covers for the cars. At some point, they even introduced a car of their own production. Add suitcases, head boxes, a wash basin, and could even transform into a dining room, bedroom, or a study. Around the same time, Louis Vuitton sponsored the creation of aircraft designed by George Children, Pierre, and Jean. George himself was fond of aircraft modeling in his youth, and his sons inherited his passion. However, not a single plane or helicopter of their design took off. While his brothers were experimenting with aircraft, George's third son, Gustin Louis Vuitton, took over the family business. In 1934, Coco Chanel commissioned the Squire bag. In 1955, its design was changed slightly, and the bag received the name Chazelize. After many changes, in 1992, the classic version of the bag was produced under the name Alma bag. Today, it's one of the most popular Louis Vuitton models. Just like his legendary grandfather and father, Gustin Louis Vuitton always knew what the clients needed most. Automobiles grew more common and made trips to VC affordable and fashionable. So he created the Key Powell, a compact and spacious travel trunk designed specifically for short trips, yet just enough space to fit clothes for a weekend by the sea. And it became a prototype of the gym bags we use today. Soon, a smaller copy of the Keep All appeared, the Speedy Bag. In the middle of the century, Audrey Hepburn commissioned this bag for herself, launching the second wave of the Speedy model's popularity. A true style icon, Hepburn immortalized the bag. In 1932, the company presented a new item that became the quintessence of luxury, the Noe handbag for carrying champagne. Noe stands for a no in French and refers to the Old Testament. It's believed that it was Noah who planted the first vineyard after the flood and then cultivated grapes. However, the bag quickly ceased to be associated only with champagne and turned into a fashion accessory. The history of the brand during World War II is shrouded in mystery. Its papers and documents are believed to have been lost in the fire, but it is a known fact that the company supported the Nazis and the German occupation. Louis Vuitton's new heyday began in the 1950s and 1960s. Its now classic suitcases were just a small part of a wide range of products that LV produced. Only they were too heavy for air travel, so even the classics of Louis Vuitton models were renewed. Then small handbags actually came into vogue. Along with the super popular Speedy, there came a Papillon cylindrical bag, actively promoted by the model Twiggy. The PVC-coated canvas provided the flexibility of the material and allowed the creation of new models of bags. The monogram has been changed at some point too. The scale and number of patterns have been made smaller to look better on tiny bags, wallets, and business card holders. At that time, the company was run by Gustin's daughter, Odile Vuitton, and her husband, Henri Rackman. The brand opened store after store around the world. 1987 marked the company's merging with the Maud Chandon and creation of LVMH. This company, now one of the largest and most expensive ones in the world, is a true embodiment of luxury. In 2019, the company's valuation amounted to over 53 billion euros. LVMH owns the world's largest fashion houses, cosmetics, jewelry, and alcohol brands. 
This empire is led by Bernard Arnault, a man who completely changed the world of fashion by founding LVMH. In 1997, Louis Vuitton made Marc Jacobs his artistic director, and he came to fame due to his famous grunge collection for the Perry Alice brand. Even though his collection became iconic and went down in history, the designer was fired for being too innovative. That's why he enthusiastically accepted the offer made by Bernard Arnault. The designer faced a real challenge. He had to make a collection for a fashion house that never had anything to do with designing clues. He took inspiration from the design of Louis Vuitton's first suitcase, the Trianon. The result was a minimalistic line of clothing that corresponded to the fashion trends of the 90s. Now, the Louis Vuitton brand produces clothing, accessories, shoes, and jewelry. Marc Jacobs breathed new life into the monotonous classic handbag style. In the 2000s, Marc launched a series of collaborations, the first being a collaboration with the artist Steven Sprouse in 2001, and together they covered the classic LV bags and suitcases with graffiti. And this was just the beginning. Soon Takashi Murakami came to work with Louis Vuitton. He reinvented the classic monogram and saturated it with new colors. Soon Louis Vuitton and Rei Kawakuba opened the Calm de Gasson store in Tokyo. Kawakuba created a collection of bags specifically for it. The Japanese artist Yaoi Kusama and later Sofia Coppola too introduced their collections made in collaboration with the Louis Vuitton brand. In 2008, the fashion house decided to attract the male audience and created a new version of the Damier pattern. Damier Graphite. It looks less flamboyant and fits perfectly into the Louis Vuitton lineup. Marc Jacobs went down in the history of the brand as the initiator of some of its most striking shows. His models rode on a merry-go-round and appeared on the podium from an elevator or an escalator. He managed to renew Louis Vuitton and made celebs buy Louis Vuitton bags again. In 2013, Marc Jacobs left the post of artistic director. He was replaced by Nikola Joski, known for reviving the Balenciaga fashion house. At Louis Vuitton, he managed to combine the aesthetics of classic with current trends. He also thought back to the fashion house's history and introduced new bags in the very first collection he designed. His petite mall, which echoes the design of the LV classic suitcases, instantly became a bestseller among fashionistas from all over the world. Joske turned his attention to the Brent's monogram and experimented with it, following Marc Jacobs' path. He also collaborated with Ray Kawakuba and Carl Lagerfeld, who designed a bag for Louis Vuitton's 160th anniversary. His collections of women's clothing were also heavily influenced by street fashion mixed with classics, the well-known checked pattern. The collection included trench coats, track suits, classic skinny pants, tweed miniskirts, and cocktail dresses inspired by the 1940s and 1980s. In 2006, Paul Halber started working on the brand's men's collection. Before that, he had worked for Mason Margiela. His style was a combination of the classic men's cut with the latest trends. He changed the fit of the jackets and expanded the line of shoes and bags. In 2011, Halbers was replaced by Kim Jones, who was the first to bring streetwear to the brand's DNA. Under his leadership, the brand started paying more attention to designing tracksuits and sneakers. The highlight of the Jones era was the 2017 collaboration with Supreme. The oldest luxury fashion house showed the new generation that it can be fascinating too, even if the LV symbol isn't as significant to them as it is to their parents. In 2018, Kim Jones left Louis Vuitton for Dior, also owned by LVMH, and was replaced by Virgil Abloh, who runs the off-white streetwear brand. Abloh went even further in modernizing the brand and attracted a younger audience. Unfortunately, his first collection became a major scandal. It was dedicated to Michael Jackson and was presented just a week before the release of Leave in Neverland. Later, Abloh was accused of plagiarism, but that didn't make his collection any less popular. When speaking about the most prominent designers of this fashion house, it's hard not to mention the most popular counterfeit. Ironically, the monogram which once was aimed to secure the brand from fakes is now one of the most counterfeited images in the world. And even among the scammers who fake the LV logo, there is a real star. The designer Daniel Day, also known as Dapper Dan, 
and in 1980s, he set up a factory in Harlem to produce clothes with the iconic monogram. At some point, it became so popular that even the New York celebs wore his clothing. The high quality of his clothes and designs brought him fame, but not for long. His career ended due to litigation in the 1990s. As you can see, even fakes of this luxurious fashion house were outstanding quality. All in all, Louis Vuitton is a company with a rich history. It started as a brand for empresses and now it's fit for superstars. The fashion house's signature became a symbol of high status and has remained such for over 160 years. Few fashion houses can say the same over their history, and most importantly, Louis Vuitton is a brand that stays relevant and fascinating even after so long.